good afternoon. Uh, Robin, he had this saying, uh, usually at the end of, and chances are if you're in this room, you were either at a team dinner or a breakfast or a lunch at some point in your life, right, with Robin. But uh, inevitably, after each one of these meals, you walk out to the car, and he would, at some point, you know, just kind of encapsulate what happened, think about the, the, the meal and the conversations, and he would just stop and say, man, we know some strange people. <laughs> and looking over this wonderful crowd, damn, you showed, up, you showed up today. How about that, huh? All of you, you're strange. It's okay, though. Look around. It's wonderful. And uh, Robin would have it no other way. Uh, my name is Dave First. Welcome to the aptly named Robin Miller. It's a celebration of life, and we are going to do just that. We're going to celebrate today uh, because, I mean, Robin, he wouldn't want a pity party. It's not going to be a funeral, which I know you saw on the invitations. So we have some ground rules today, okay? Here we go. It's okay to clap, which you've already done a little bit of. Uh, it's okay to cuss, <laughs> right? It's okay to bitch. It's okay to hate, right? What did Robin say? Hate is good. Uh, and it's okay to have fun today, all right? So it's going to be a lot of... I mean, it, Here's the thing, if you're, if you're easily offended, this is probably not the room for you. Then again, if you were a friend of Robin, chances are you weren't easily offended, So, which is all good. But at the end, if this seems more like a roast than a toast, just kind of roll with it. We're going to enjoy this moment. I will say this, though. It's appropriate that we're doing this here uh, at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Uh, before this year's NTT IndyCar Series race during Brickyard Weekend, I got a call from Jay Fry who's here today, and he's like, hey, how can we get Robin up to the front of the grid before the race starts so he can be up there for the flyover of the national anthem? Uh, he can see Sarah Fisher, the pace car. I'm like, this is a great idea. So Robin shows up literally about 15 minutes before the engines are going to fire. I grab the keys to the golf cart and I put him in the passenger seat. Steve Shunks in the seat behind us. His sister Diane's behind us. Uh, we're making a beeline to the front of the grid. I mean, we're like zigzagging, right, through the entire grid. I mean, drivers are already getting in the cars, and, which was cool because Robin's seeing all these guys again. And he, you know, we're passing Graham Rahal, and he leans over and says, God, I wish, I wish Graham would win another race. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. And we'd pass Colton Herta. God, that kid is good. And you can just hear his voice, right? God, that kid is good. And then we pass Tony Kanaan, and he, how do you think TK really is? And I, I said, I don't know. That's, you know. that's the great mystery of racing. We really don't know how. I mean, we got to do some carbon dating at some point, but other than that, we really not, we're not quite sure. But anyway, it, it, we're weaving through fans, crew guys, officials, drivers, and they're all doing the same thing. They're high-fiving them. They're coming up for hugs. Uh, hey, Robin, we miss you. Good, good luck. We got, the, you know, Miller Strong. It was one thing after another. And it was awesome. Mario was there for a big hug. Uh, and I know that meant a lot to the family and, and us as well. So yeah, it, it's, it's just amazing. And he turned to me at one point during all this. Again, we're weaving. It's like 15 minutes. The clock's on. We've got to get out there. And he goes, this is the greatest day of my life. And I'm thinking about this. And, and, and I, I, I guess so. I mean, here's a guy that has done and seen everything in racing. I mean, he is the, literally the... Indianapolis sports version uh, of the movie Almost Famous. And if you don't know the movie, you've got homework this weekend. Go home and watch Almost Famous and picture the young kid as Robin Miller. And that's, that's exactly who, who this is. Um, so it was, it, was, it was just perfect in the end that the sport that he loved so much and poured so much energy and passion into was giving it back to him at that very moment when perhaps he needed to hear it the most. And at the end of the day, you know, we should all be that lucky. Um, we're going to start today on behalf of Diane and the family. Uh, we want to start by thanking Robin's doctors and nurses that are all in attendance here today. Please stand uh, and be recognized. Thank you so much. Uh, 
Uh, needless to say, a big thank you to the staff and management of Indianapolis Motor Speedway for opening uh, your rather wet doors to us <laughs> today. By the way, the rain, no question, this is Miller, right? Uh, and to that end, we have some very special guests with us today. Super Techs, A.J. Foyt's in the house. Well, I tell you, Mario Andretti is here. Mario, great to see you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, Roger Pinsky, thank you very much for being here today. Mark Miles, Jay Fry, Doug Bowles, thank you all. It's, 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 it's a tremendous honor that you are sharing your Saturday with us. Uh, some former champions are here. Tony Kanaan is here in the front row. I saw Takuma Sato, two-time Indy 500 champion, he's here. The aforementioned Graham Rahal is right over here as well. Graham, thanks, buddy. Uh, members of the Pacers organization, members of the Colts organization, uh, former Indiana Mr. Basketball, Billy Shepard, ABA Zone is here somewhere. Thank you, Billy. Let's begin, though, today with uh, baby Kathy Riggs, Robin's cousin, who will lead us in a prayer. Thank you. Don't ask, but um, I'm very honored to be here today. Um, I was very touched that, um, and I feel special that Diane and Dan, I think Robin would want me here too. I'm going to be kind of the serious part, if there's a little bit of serious in today, um, but I feel so special to be here. And each one of you should feel very, very special to be here because you were invited. And Robin loved you like he loved me, and he... He, um, we were his inner circle, and um, I just want you to reflect just a few minutes on what Robin meant to you. I'm going to have a couple of minutes of silence, and I just want you to close your eyes and just think about something that made Robin endearing to you and why you loved Robin and he loved you. So after a couple of minutes of silence, I'm just going to ask for thanks for Robin's life and what he meant to us. So let's have a couple of minutes of silence, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to celebrate Robin. We loved Robin and what he meant to each one of us, and Robin was very special. He was very unique, and he was a character, but we loved him, and he loved us. And Father, we just thank you for the lessons that Robin taught us through gifts that you have given gave him. He always had the gift of time. He always had time for us. It didn't matter if it was a hello or how you doing, but he had time for us. And we need to take a lesson from that, Father. And we thank you for his generosity. All of us were privileged to be a part of his generosity, whether it was through a meal or a snack or whatever it was, Father. Robin taught us how to be so, so generous, and we're thankful for that. And, Father, we thank you that the way he loved he loved so fiercely the people that he cared about, and we wish we could take a lesson from Robin and be like Robin. Father, we thank you that um, you have promised us a life that, lives, that goes on forever. You have given us the gift of eternal life, and uh, you have said in your word, let not your hearts be troubled, but trust in God and trust also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Father, we thank you that we have that gift of eternal life through your son, Jesus. And Father, as we close this part, we just ask that you would especially be with Diane and Ashley and Emily as they miss, have days coming where they're going to miss Robin. We're all going to miss Robin. And all those first, wow, I wish Robin was here, but comfort us as we take an example from Robin's life. And Father, we'll give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name, amen. As you uh, might imagine, there's a, a lot to get to here this afternoon, and we wanted to begin with a way that really best encapsulates a tremendous life and career. Here's NBC's Lee Dippy. A true friend always tells you the truth 
even when it's hard to hear. And Robin Miller was that friend to open wheel racing. Born in Indianapolis, a native Hoosier, Robin could not wait to be part of the action at a young age. He stooged for Jim Herdebees at the Indy 500, drove USAC midgets in the 70s and 80s, all while covering the racing scene as a newspaper reporter for the Indianapolis Star. Robin's style was very matter of fact, calling out owners and drivers alike. As long as they keep treating this like a monopoly game, nobody's gonna respect him. But he was always quick to sing the praises of those same people when they earned it. What a future this kid's got. Pretty good way to start his Indianapolis Motor Speedway career. After making his mark as a writer, Robin brought his distinctive storytelling style to broadcasting, flourishing at ESPN, Speed Channel, and who could forget those grid runs with NBC Sports. How is it this guy has a job and I don't? Because <laughs> you took the buyout and I got a lot of debt. Race fans always look forward to whatever Robin would say next, whether it be on air or in his mailbag for Racer Magazine even if they only wanted to passionately disagree. Even if you didn't love Robin, you respected him for speaking the truth. He was the one who pushed us all to make the sport he loved so much better. There's no disputing, he did just that, as only Robin Miller could. Robin Miller, I saw him this morning. This one's for you, baby. We love you, Robin, everything that you do. The Motorsport Hall of Fame inductee fought cancer and leukemia for a lengthy time. He's survived by his sister Diane, her family, and the entire motorsport community. Godspeed, Robin. Thank you, Lee. No one knows a, a good storyteller quite like another really good storyteller. He also happens to be a world champion and one of the most gifted drivers to ever compete. Please welcome the 1969 winner of the Indianapolis 500, Mr. Mario Andretti. Hi, everyone. What a testimony for Robin, you know, to see so many, he's actually embarrassed, quite honestly. And if you know him, you know that he is. But, um, you know, all of us have, uh, I'm sure, uh, some many stories to tell about him. I'm going to start from the beginning. I'm one of the few, maybe, few that uh, remembers when he had a legitimate job as a newspaper man right at the beginning with the, with the star. And um, what I remember clearly is how annoying it was. <laughs> Why? Because he really wanted to dig into everything. And, uh, you know, we always, when we're doing our job, everyone is just focused and uh, you don't want to be bothered. But, uh, uh, and then, then you sit back and, and reflect on it and say, you know what? This kid is really trying to do his job. And, uh, and that's really what it was. And, and he was on a rev limiter from the beginning, always, always. And, uh, and from that standpoint, uh, you have to appreciate someone. You know, um, one of my quotes about qualifying is, uh, if everything seems under control, you're just not going fast enough. Well, that applied to him, quite honestly, and his job. And, um, and I mean, this was his life, just like the sport is to all of us. As, us as drivers, you know, you devote everything, every inch of your energy to it. And, uh, and he did the same thing. He did the same thing with, with his job. Uh, he obviously, uh, now and then, you know, uh, just kind of bruised a few, few ribs and few uh, nerves along the way, you know, but uh, it's only because he was so brutally honest that he just believed in what he really was saying, and that is in the best interest of the sport. I mean, uh, uh, we, uh, as you know, all of you know, I'm sure in this room, uh, uh, there were a period of time where, uh, you know, uh, things were very, very confusing and upside down uh, back in, uh, you know, in, in the early 90s and, uh, or late 90s. And, uh, 
And, and again, he, uh, he chose to take sides because he knew what was right. And, uh, and even that, that even, he did it, it cost him his job, basically. But he was a survivor because he knew there was a place for him, no question in the sport. And he knew how much we appreciated him because, again, you know, from a career standpoint, uh, I mean, he knew it all. I mean, he just saw it even, uh, he, he had a, an appreciation for what the drivers are all about, in a sense, because he tried to kill himself driving a midget anyway for a few years. So he knew all of that. And uh, so he was so much one of us. And, um, and, you know, his entire career, his entire life was totally, totally dedicated to the sport, to all of us, to what we loved. And, uh, and again, you know, I don't know much more can be said about that because, uh, and again, I can see, you know, from all of you, this audience that uh, took time to, to be here and, and celebrate his life. You, as, as we said, uh, uh, he, you know, he, he meant so much and he will always be with us. And he, he'll be an example, quite honestly, for so many to, uh, you know, to follow. So. Here again, uh, I could probably go on and on. Maybe I should have made some notes, so, so I'm, I'm rambling on. But, uh, but nevertheless, um, he, again, he's up there just smiling and, uh, because he knows that uh, you know, he has so many, many, many friends, and uh, certainly we are. Uh, we, we loved him. Even AJ loved him. <laughs> That's what I thought. So, that's, that's saying something, quite honestly, <laughs> you know. So, again, um, Robin, Godspeed, and uh, we'll see each other sooner than you might think. <laughs> ah, from one racer to another. Thank you, Mario. Oh, yes? We appreciate you coming. He has a wedding to go to. The busiest man in motorsports. Thank you, Mario. Please welcome a uh, friend of the family, John Herrick. John? So uh, I've been a friend of the Miller Zachary clan for my whole life, and uh, met Robin when I was like eight, and I had a big passion for sports. And um, when I was about 16, I told Robin Miller, I said, "Robin, I think I'm going to get into broadcasting." And he goes, "Why? <laughs> Why are you doing that?" I said, "I just love it. You know, I think it'd be a great thing for me." So I graduate from high school. I said, "Robin, can I put you down as a reference for me?" He said, well, I'd have been mad if you didn't, Johnny. You better do that. So I put him down as a reference. And um, I was working at a radio job in Oklahoma for about six years. And it was a good job. It was going great. But I just kind of felt like I'd outgrown it. And so I found out that there was a news anchor position open at WIBC. And uh, I applied for it. And I eventually got it. About two months into the job, I asked my boss. I said, did you, by the way, did you call any of my references at all? And he goes, oh yeah, I called all of them. But the first one was the one that stuck out to me the most. I said, what's that? He goes, Robin Miller. If you have Robin Miller on your resume as a reference, that means something. So Robin vouched for me and said, if I was starting any radio station at all, building it from scratch, I would hire John Herrick. So that probably shows Robin's questionable judgment at some times, but... <laughs> Uh, I appreciate the, uh, the, the support that he gave me because I probably wouldn't have gotten hired if it wasn't for Robin standing up for me there. And then 2018 was my first uh, Indy 500 race that I covered being back at the track and I saw Robin in the media center and I said, you know, Robin, this is probably my first time being back at the Speedway in person in like eight years. He's like, well, it's good to, it's good to have you home. And I said, well, I don't think I would have been home here at all if it wasn't if it wasn't for you so 
I think the biggest thing with Robin that I will always you know, cherish is his loyalty. And I've talked to several friends over the last couple months about it's going to be weird not seeing Robin there, and it's going to feel like the void is, is left. In the physical sense, I would say yes, that's true. There will, it will be hard to not see him you know, six chairs down from me in the uh, IMS Media Center. But his, his essence, his spirit, his spirit, and everything that he meant to me and to all of you in here and to everyone in that media center, uh, that's, that's not going anywhere. So thanks for always being with us, R. We love you. Uh, what I remember the, the old days of the Indianapolis Star, I, you know, I think of the great sports writers, it was a different era, right? People would not really know much about what was happening in the world until you opened up the Star on a Monday morning or Tuesday morning and you go through it over your cup of coffee or whatever. Um, and, you know, with all due, all due respect to my TV friends, sorry, um, I mean, the Star was the thing to open up in central Indiana and in Indianapolis. And when it came to Columbus, uh, not only did Robin certainly rank at the top of that must read, but so did our next speaker. Uh, please welcome not only a former colleague of Robin's, but a dear, dear friend as well. Please welcome Mr. Bill Benner. call me wild man that was the nickname that Robin gave to me uh, and I wore it proudly on our softball t-shirts that we had okay I will not tell you the story about how Robin stole my girlfriend while I was away at basic training in Fort Leonard Wood Missouri <laughs> because it actually turned out to be a blessing because I moved from that girl to meeting my wife uh, 49 years ago yesterday as a matter of fact Sherry so yeah And Robin was the best man in our wedding. He arrived outside the church in LaPorte, Indiana, towing his midget race car, and he left shortly thereafter off to another race because Robin was always looking for the next fast lane. What I will tell you is that what Robin and I had in common. We were both from the south side, Robin from Southport, they had the fancy uniforms, and I was from Center Grove, we were the farm boys. We both broke in as score boys at the Indianapolis Star. And that was a number you called 633-1200 to get scores on games, settle gambling bets. But among our duties, we're doing booze runs for the sports editor. <laughs> we both got our first big break in sports writing by the grace of the late, great Cy McBride. And I know Cy and Robin are, are together uh, because Cy, Cy set up lives for both of us, and we wouldn't be here and wouldn't have accomplished what we accomplished without Cy. We both got our first bylines in the star when we were 19 years old. We both lavishly and stupidly spent uh, our first paychecks on sports cars. Mine was a Triumph Spitfire, four-cylinder piece of crap, and Robin, of course, got a Lotus Europa. We both covered the Indiana Pacers in the American Basketball Association and drank beer with the great Bobby Slick Leonard. Well, I drank beer with Slick, Robin didn't drink. We both loved the adrenaline rush of daily print journalism, of beating a tight deadline with a well-crafted game story, or laying out the sports section and thriving in the, in the crush of those five edition fire alarms on Friday and Saturday nights, and nobody except for all of his colleagues from the Indy Star, if you ever experienced Robin in what we called the slot on a Saturday night, laying out the newspaper, well, you've never heard more imaginative uses of the F-bomb ever, ever, <laughs> ever. We both rose to the ranks of columnists, developing love-hate relationships with our readers along the way. We both pissed off a basketball coach in Bloomington and his legion of followers. In addition to newspapering, we broke, branched into radio and television gigs, and Robin was the local pioneer of that. We both earned writing Hall of Fame status, 
In Robin's case, it was well earned, and in my case, I guess they ran out of more worthy nominees. And we both left the Indianapolis Star within a month of one another. For various reasons, it was in time to go. But for all we shared, especially love and friendship, and John, you mentioned it, loyalty. God, was he the most loyal guy you ever do? There was something Robin had that I didn't. That skinny SOB had balls. He had large, large balls. He was afraid of nothing or no one. And in the end, that included dying. But there was one more thing that important thing that Robin and I shared, and that was a love of the city and the state and its institutions, and especially in Robin's case, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, where we are gathered here today to celebrate the one and only R. So Diane, if you could come up for just a moment. And while Diane comes up, I do want to emphasize that I'm speaking for all my Indianapolis Star colleagues. We had an all-star team during the golden age of sports journalism. So I am so proud to be here today to say that I now share even one more thing with Robin. On behalf of Gar Governor Eric Holcomb, and with the help of his staff, including my wonderful sister-in-law, Jane Jankowski, and my great brother, David, I am deeply honored to present the state's highest individual instinct, distinction and honor, the Sagamore of the Wabash, to my pal, the one and only Robin Lee Miller. He will always and forever be a Hoosier's Hoosier. Diane, here you go. Thank you, God bless. Arguably, uh, what Robin was to writing about motorsports, our next guest is to competing in it. As a team owner, uh, he's an 18-time winner of the Indianapolis 500 and now, of course, takes great pride as a steward of that great race and certainly this world-class facility. Please welcome the chair of Penske Corp, Mr. Roger Penske. Well, for Robin, I wore my black pants today and I didn't wear a t-shirt just so I wanted to be sure that I was uh, in line with uh, everyone. Uh, as you can see, I brought some notes. I'm not quite as good as Andretti at uh, just standing up. Uh, but uh, as we said many times today, this is a celebration of Robin's life. And I want to thank everybody from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, uh, IndyCar Series, and IMSP for coming here and letting us, Diane and the family, share this special moment uh, with all of us. He was clearly one of a kind and one of the most colorful, engaging personality that our sport has ever seen. I know we're all gonna miss Robin's passion, his humor, his insight, and his knowledge and support of IndyCar racing. I knew Robin for over 50 years. It's hard to believe that he and I started together here in 1969. We got to know each other pretty well. I went in one direction, obviously, and he went in another. But I think the first thing that he wanted to do was be behind the wheel. But as I said earlier today, that really wasn't his calling. And because of that, he took his skills in another direction. And they certainly would shine. And I think of all the times that uh, 
I sat face to face with Rob, and he had a story I just wish he wouldn't talk about, but uh, that didn't, didn't make any difference, I can tell you, with him. Robin found a true calling, I think, as a reporter for more than five decades. And I think he was one of the best in the business. And Bill, you know, to think about you and reading your columns and, and, and the comments today, right on. I mean, I think that uh, ter just terrific. And the wonderful award uh, from the governor, uh, could, it couldn't be better. But he worked for the Star for 33 years. And then think about Auto Week and Racer, Speed Channel, ESPN, and of course, the last decade uh, at NBC. I think he kept in shape by running up and down the pit lane, didn't he? Uh, chasing AJ or someone for a story. Uh, welcome, AJ. But no one really covered the sport any better than he did. He loved it. He loved the people, the drivers, the fans. There's no question he made a big difference. And the fans, I would say, was probably one of the things that made a big difference. And uh, they wanted to hear his stories. And I think his direct style wasn't always popular with a paddock. But that's really, that's what he wanted. He wanted to be different. Many times, I found myself on opposite sides with Robin. But you know, at the end of the day, he was a true guy. He cared a lot about racing. We talked about the people. We talked about the people within the sport. But I got to know another side of Robin Miller, January 6, 2020. And that was the acquisition date of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And it was the one scoop that he didn't have, that we were going to buy the track. And even I remember coming in that day to, to meet with Mark Miles. And Doug Bowles ran into me at 7 o'clock in the morning and said, what are you doing here? Well, of course, Robin didn't have that story. But obviously, following that, uh, he became a real anchor for me and for the Speedway. He was my connection and our connection to the fans. And it, wasn't, it was every single week, he would send me a note, I got this from a fan or I got that from a fan, what do you think? And I remember getting in a golf cart and going around the track with him, showing him some of the things that we were doing and wanted to do. But he was that connection. And I think that uh, he became a real key element of this track and will be forever. And for me, I can only thank him for the friend, the friendships, when I see these great slides here today, there's so many things that we can all remember. The guy with the long, I think a long hair. God, we don't have long hair today, do we? But uh, he was uh, something special. So all I want to say to all of you is uh, we lost a great friend. And I think today this is going to be the last lap for Robin Miller at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And Diane, to you and your family, thank you for giving us this opportunity today. And we love him. We're going to see him, all of us, some, sometime. And he'll be there writing the story and have the scoop. So thank you very much. Thanks, Roger. You're absolutely right, too. Uh, at the end of a, a race week, and I feel confident Roger joined a lot of us and made a point to tune into a, a show on something that was called Speed, uh, a network. It was completely dedicated to racing. Younger folks may not know that that existed at one point. Uh, and there was a show on Sunday nights called Wind Tunnel. I mean, why read, with all due respect, but why read something in the paper the next day that you could see that night on Wind Tunnel? And, you know, if we were all lucky, maybe, just maybe, Robin would drop an F-bomb on live television. <laughs> Here's a look back, including the final episode that ever aired. It's a Robin Miller night. It's a Robin Miller night. You 
See, fellas, I knew they'd get Robin Miller. I'm not sure who that is. That's the guy who hates everything. That guy? Oh, him. I love him. Oh, I just love balding middle-aged men. Oh, is he wearing that loud sweatshirt? Hey, isn't this the paper that fired Robin Miller? Loser! Yay, Robin Miller, Robin Miller! <laughs> He's a... <laughs> Guess what? Don't start. Let me tell you something. I'm gonna hit you in the nuts. Did you hit your head when you were bull riding? Yeehaw! How in the hell do you practice a monster truck? Would you fly with Jack Roush? I learned from the best how to be grumpy. Milka who? I'm going Sizzler. What do I got to do? It's a Sunday night. It's a wind tunnel. After I get fired here, I'll need a job. <laughs> What's wrong with me? <laughs> Miller, that, that's a great question. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Been hanging around racetracks all my life. No excuse. <laughs> Elaborate on that. We're in a reflective mood tonight. Tell us about the path that led you to this final episode of a canceled TV show. Well, think about it. I've been watching racing for 50 years. I've been writing about it for 45. For the last 15, I've been on various television shows, even though I've got a face for radio. <laughs> I got to drive midgets in USAC for eight or nine years. I got to be in Indy 500 pit crews. I've, you don't have to tell me about how great my life has been. I understand when you can combine your job and your passion, it's very rare. Hi, I'm Robin Miller's cousin Kristen, and I think about staying up late to, to see Robin on the news when I was a little girl, being able to watch him and listen to him on Q95, and sometimes mom would have to cover our ears on what we'd hear, <laughs> or seeing him on Wind Tunnel. I've always been the biggest fan of my cousin. So I think when you think about a place like this, you think about all of the legends, all of the amazing characters. But to me, it was always Robin that was the coolest. There was something so special about him going all in on life. He went for what he loved. His passion was racing. He loved racing. He loved racers. He loved the speedway. He loved his art. He wanted to be good at what he did. He cared about the quality of his work, but he also just was so passionate and fully dedicated. And it's been an inspiration for me. I love my work, and I think a lot of the courage to believe that big things are possible come from being able to observe my cousin, Robin Miller. When I think about um, us all pursuing our passions, I think we are all created for something special, and certainly Robin was special. But we know he was doing exactly what he loved every minute of every day. And I think about his nieces and the way that they dance and the way that they give everything they have to be their very best. I think about all of you and the way that you dedicate your life to this sport, but it was all about passion and all about love with Robin. And I just, I take that lesson and I'm gonna carry it every day to know that anything is possible, even a guy from South Indianapolis covering sports, fired, um, speaking his mind, nothing stopped him because it was inside his heart to chase his dreams. And so I so admire him for that. And um, I hope that someday we can all look back and think about the inspiration that Robin was in going after it. I also have a reading that I'd like to share um, from the family, from a cousin Diane. It's called True Greatness by C.E. Flynn. A man is as great as the dream he dreams, as great as the love he bears as great as the value he redeems and the happiness he shares. A man is as great as the thoughts he thinks, as the worth he has attained, as the fountains of which his spirits drink and the insight he has gained. A man is as great as the truth he speaks, as great as the help he gives, as great as the destiny he seeks, and as great as the life he lives. Robin Miller was a great man, and we're all better knowing him. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, now, the 1983 Indianapolis 500 champion, the gas man, Tom Sneva. Our pal Robin. We all know the passion Robin had for racing. One of the things he would do that helped make him one of the best journalists that we've ever had in racing 
was the effort he put in to learn more about his subjects away from the racetrack. Yeah, he used to be the organizer of all the softball teams, basketball teams, golf outings, any kind of activity that would seem fun at the time. Now, sure, a lot of that was social, but after a while, I realized he was using all these things to learn more about the people he had to cover, whether it was drivers, owners, crew members, sponsors, or PR guys. I can still remember some of the fun we had with our softball team. We had that dynamic pitcher-catcher combo, the Bettenhausens, Gary and Merle. Between them, we might have had two good arms. Uniforms were usually t-shirts that Robin would hustle from one of the donut suppliers. Gary B. would wear the T over his racing uniform, so after the game, he was ready for the gentleman's club that just happened to be right next to the field where we always seemed to play our games. It wasn't about winning as much as it was about having fun. Well, I could go on and on about Robin stories, but everybody has them. We're all going to miss Robin. They didn't just break the mold because there couldn't have been a mold for Robin. Thanks, Robin, for all the great times. Tom Sneva. Well, as somewhat already been mentioned here, at one point or another, you know, it seemed Robin wrote for just about everyone. I mean, his byline appeared more times than the name Foyt on an Indy 500 entry list, let's face it. So uh, it was a few times, right? But one of the organizations who took advantage of Robin's abilities was a magazine called Racer. He loved writing for Racer. He loved the mailbag. He loved doing videos for Racer as well. And what was always interesting after a race was like, who, who would shoot the Robin Miller video after a win? Jim Roeder, who was here uh, to help us out with all these videos today, he shot a lot. Steve Schunk would shoot some. And then a couple years ago, I introduced him to the idea of like, well, you don't need these big $35,000 cameras. All you need uh, is a cell phone to shoot videos. And I never, he looked at me I'm like, what? Yep. <laughs> right there in front of me. <laughs> so we did that for a while. It, it was all good. Uh, but for more on Racer, please welcome the founder, president, and executive publisher, Mr. Paul Fanner. All right, uh, let's uh, begin by just pointing out that this is the largest gathering of Robin's favorite assholes <laughs> in history. So, uh, and I'm, I'm an asshole as well, so. Uh, but uh, one of my last conversations with Robin uh, uh, was one about being honest and carrying it forward. You know, he was worried there wouldn't be another one like him, and there won't be. Um, but he told me to be honest, and I'll, I'll be honest, I, I really should have peed before I came up here, but um, that's probably oversharing. Um, but, you know, I, I, it's fantastic, by the way, to see AJ here because he, he won the first five races I ever saw. Um, so uh, it was all the more special that Robin's favorite ever sentence that he wrote uh, about uh, during the IRL era, which was all about opportunity for deserving drivers, there was one driver in particular Robin was particularly amused by, which was a fellow named uh, Marco Greco, who wrote the big Checo uh, to AJ. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I avoided writing the big Checo to Robin over the years. That's why we're still in business. Um, <laughs> but the, the thing I wanted to get across today is that uh, Robin's life uh, was a love letter to the sport and all of the people in this room. I want you to think about that. Uh, the passion on a day-to-day -day basis dealing with Robin, you know, we started working together during an ill-fated project called Champ Car Magazine, which I believe was the best magazine we actually ever produced. And he was all in on that. And uh, the, uh, the thing I noticed is that uh, he pushed everybody, you know. Uh, I received a text from the afterlife that there was a fucking F1 story at the top of the homepage, which he hated. Uh, <laughs> and now he is in the hero slot with his live stream at the top of the homepage on racer.com. To the very end, he wanted to know how we're doing on traffic, how we're doing on this. And it's fitting that today, of all days, I'm <laughs> uh, we, for the first time in our history, looking back 12 months, passed 10 million user, unique users in a 12-month period. And I, 
I say that because Robin looked at stuff like that all the time. He cared. That's four million more than we had last year, which was two million more than we had the year before. So he believed you're all out there if you're a race fan. And if you're a race fan watching this on the live stream, uh, although, uh, you know, Robin admired everybody in this room, he always reminded us who we all worked for. I'm going to take the Robin Miller finger. We work for you, all you people that watch these races on TV. You buy tickets. You buy magazines. All of us work for you, and Robin never let us forget it. He had balls the size of, you know, watermelons when it came to that particular <laughs> outlook. And, you know, uh, uh, you know the, uh, we don't have a lot of time. We have about the time it takes to run a qualifying sequence at Indianapolis, so I'm going to give you four good ones um, and come to a conclusion here. And I think when we all go out and leave this building today, Robin would want me to remind all of you that the people that really do matter most in the sport are the fans. They own us. We don't own them. They're not our fans. We're the thing they're passionate about and love. And if we get them energized and get them excited about what we do, uh, we have a future. And there were a million shares of content off of our website in May. Why? Over half of those were IndyCar stories. That number of shares eclipsed the entire share total for the month before for everything combined. This sport is winning on a scale I haven't seen it win before. And that's because people care about it. That's the job of Robin Miller. His job was to make you care, make you feel something. And if you don't feel something when you think about Robin today, you're dead. <laughs> and he would point out just like he is. So uh, I, he had a really dark, <laughs> He had a really dark, funny sense of humor. Um, he was, my last conversation with him, he was, you know, really not in good physical shape, but he was still trying to finish the mailbag. He wanted to finish the mailbag because he loved interacting with the fans, and his wish to me is we find a way to do something like that going forward, and I promise you we will, because the fans have to be heard, and, and credit to you, Mark, for for understanding that and developing the friendship you developed with, with Robin. I know it meant a lot to him. And uh, we all appreciate that too, because when we all go forward from this moment, there won't be another Robin Miller, but there will be someone. The person that will change the world is probably among us. They're probably young. I don't want to scare them away because we're all too serious and corporate. I, I want them to be that long-haired, scary kid that annoys Mario and Dreddy because I was one of those kids. And our future is down to the enthusiasm of the audience. And passion is infectious. So you all have the Robin Miller virus. Go spread it. Uh, one of the many things uh, about Robin was his ability to take a situation like say leadership changes in IndyCar racing, and, and there may have been a few over the decades or so, uh, but he took those moments and turned them into personal friendships. Randy Menard is one of those examples. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Mr. Randy Menard. Well, good afternoon. What We've heard some amazing stories here today, and I mean, the things that just I keep hearing over and over is about Robin's passion, his love, his loyalty, his connection to the fans. We knew Robin was a legend, that's for sure, and we're confirming that today. But I think it's part of my job today is also bring up, there's a lot of facts and myths that go along with a, with a legend. So I thought I'd share a few of them that I know. First of all, Robin Miller was an art enthusiast. That's a fact. Robin loved art. He talked about art all the time. He picked art out all the time. I thought it would be real important today, maybe I bring a, a few of his masterpieces. I think the fun part is 80% of the people here today are wearing something. 
Number two, Bobby Knight and Robin Miller were great friends. <laughs> Myth. <laughs> Dave said I could use the word hate. Robin and Bobby hated each other. Bobby would have his media team place Robin behind the tuba player in the band so Robin couldn't see a game. True story. Number three, Robin Miller loved the Indiana State Fair. Robin would hold court every year by taking 20 or 30 of his best friends there. And the whole objective was who could eat the most fried food. <laughs> Tony, am I wrong? I mean, you ate fried ice cream, fried cheeseburger, donut, just the craziest stuff in the world. The first year I went home, I threw up for an hour. <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't believe I did it. But it always ended the same way. Robin would have to go to the carnival, he'd have to win a big, huge stuffed animal, and then he had to go find a little boy or girl somewhere in the midway and give it away. Um, number five, Robin was a very law-abiding, <laughs> safe driver. The first time I rode with him was to a dirt track. I had never been so nervous in my life. He was driving 85, 90 miles an hour, and when he wasn't driving that fast, he was cussing someone out for driving 55, and he's trying to weave through the, the traffic. It was horrific. I always begged him to drive, but he would never let me. Uh, number six, Robin's fashion statement. As we can see over here on the mannequins, or uh, I would just say it probably went along with his art. But um, what a lot of people might not know was he was colorblind. The last time he wore a true suit was in the late 1970s. He was uh, uh, riding on the Indiana Pacers, and they asked him, they said, hey, Robin, why don't you go down, go shopping with us? And he went, yeah, that'd be great. So they took him shopping, and down there he found a great suit he had to have. Beautiful. It was a beautiful brown suit. So the team, they all chipped in and bought it for him. They said, Robin, you need to wear this to the NBA game tonight. Robin, all proud of this new brown suit, gets it on, wears it to the game. And everybody, the team, everybody, just thought it was hysterical. What Robin didn't realize, his brown suit was a velour light purple. <laughs> he was so embarrassed, he had to go change in his car at halftime. <laughs> that is another true, true story. Number eight, Robin, he didn't drink alcohol. Nope, never did. He didn't need it. All he needed was Pepsi. Number nine, Robin didn't cuss. <laughs> We're not going to go into that one. And number 10, Robin was proud to say that he flunked out of, out of Ball State. But I want to say, I want to change history on this a little bit. I think, I think he got his PhD from Ball State in motorsports. And I think it stood for passion, hunger, and drive. I think Robin Miller has done so much for the sport. Um, <clears throat> Robin had every opportunity in the world not to give me a chance. I wasn't a purist. I didn't know the sport. Hell, I was a cowboy. Come from a whole different sport. And he took me in and wanted to help me and teach me. He wanted his motorsports to gain from it. And, you know, uh, it, was, it was those dirt tracks. It was learning those fans from the dirt tracks. He wanted to introduce me to the best engineers, to the best mechanics. He wanted to teach me the history. Uh, he wanted, wanted me to learn about Dan Gurney's white pages. But most importantly, he wanted me to learn about what the fans wanted. That's the one thing he constantly went over and over. I used to tell my kids growing up, i say, you know what? Follow your dreams and your passion. Don't follow the money. Follow what you want to do in life. Robin Miller was the epitome of that. He did what he loved. Robin's legacy, in my opinion, will always be a straightforward approach to covering any sport that he did with no hidden agenda. He used his pen to tell stories. He used his pen to write about the history, the controversy, the scoops, to educate his fans, and yet 
make sure they were passionate about the sport and fans loved him for it. But there's another part of that pen we all saw too. He could use that pen as a sword. He could gut someone so quick in the public eye, he didn't even know what hit you. And I think Mr. Pinsky talked about it, AJ, Mario, they all were on the end of that. His gruffness, his toughness, he was, he was rough at times, but he had the biggest heart of gold. After my stint with IndyCar, I, um, I stayed in touch with him. We talked every week. And it was so much fun, to, the colorful stories. I mean, about sports, your personal lives, especially IndyCar. And I just can't say how much I'll miss him. And I know how much uh, the motorsports will miss him. Thank you. Well, we heard from a former champion, uh, and certainly, as mentioned, we, there are a few here in the crowd, this wonderful crowd here this afternoon. Uh, but to, to me, Robin had this unique ability to be as relevant with the younger generation as he did with, with the older one as well. Now, he's not young anymore, but he's still a champion. Please welcome Indy 500 winner and Indianapolis uh, IndyCar Series champion, Tony Kanaan. Tony, come on up. You're an asshole, but <laughs> anyway. First of all, I want to thank Diane for putting me on the spot. I'm wondering uh, if Robin made that request for me to be last so I wouldn't leave <laughs> after my speech, or just because he used to make fun of me that I'm, that's where I start most of my later <laughs> racist career. So for whatever it is, I'm here. Uh, I did not prepare a speech. Actually, I started to just put some notes together because I didn't think. Uh, first of all, I want to say, uh, you know, like, we're doing this. We're all happy that we're here. We're celebrating his life. But I know exactly what he was going to say if he was here. He says, this is bullshit. You know, I don't know what are you guys doing here, wasting your time. So let's waste the time together. You're not here to cuss at us, so F you, and we're going to talk about it anyway. Uh, you know, there are so many things. We could be sitting here for hours, but I will use a couple examples that I've actually learned from Robin. And we're going to hear from a couple losers as well in the meantime that we had them record something. But, you know, we kept saying about his balls. And I think, you know, when I came to America 25 years ago, Robin was the guy. And people will tell me, be careful what you tell him because, you know, this is the guy. And... I didn't speak very much of an English, and I start hanging with Robin a lot. And up to this day, my wife tells me to watch my mouth because <laughs> I can't talk like that at home with the kids. You know, like, what the hell are you doing? You know, she's like, you can't say that. Or I say, oh, God, it's like, you can't say that. So apologize to the young kids that are here. But, you know, I've learned with Robin, I mean, two people taught me in life what the Speedway meant. And that was my dad that I lost when I was 13 that showed me this race and made him promise him in a hospital bed that I was going to win this thing one day. And Robbie Miller, because I came here and he just, you know, taught me everything about it. I mean, from the past, although he kept saying that I'm 55 with my fake Brazilian passport, I am not. <laughs> I'll be 47 in December with my American passport, so. <laughs> but, you know, and, and, and I don't think, you know, anybody, everybody that came here, I don't think, I mean, he loved the Speedway more than all of us combined, and, and this is unbelievable. So I think it's more suiting than ever that we're gonna keep honoring him, and I know that's what's gonna happen. So um, I've learned with Robin how to eat the crappiest food and I have to work out twice the next day. Uh, I made a mistake in one of the state fairs to actually put a whole grilled cheese, uh, eat a whole grilled cheese in one bite, which made Robin's day, and he made me do that for 10 years in a row <laughs> in front of everybody. Uh, he used to tell me I, he d has no idea why Lauren married me, and I don't disagree with him. Um, I miss, you know, our... Shows between me, David, Dave, Dave first, and, and I, uh, and Robin at, at RTV6, uh, which uh, half of the stuff we couldn't even talk about. Um, the State Fair, actually, back to the State Fair, you know, I think Randy mentioned 
uh, we used to go. My wife actually played really good basketball, and Robin got a really kick out of that when we first went early, you know, 15, 12 years ago, and uh, we kept getting stuffed animals that actually, at one point, the guy says, she's not allowed to play here anymore. <laughs> but the creepiest part was we used to get these huge stuffed animals, which we, st we, st we still have two huge elephants in the house that it's disgusting, but they're there. But what freaked me out the most was when he used to approach a little kid and try to give that to the kid, and the parents looking like, what the hell is this guy? <laughs> I mean, what does he want? I said, Robin, you're going to get sued one of these days. <laughs> and then he would drag me. He says, oh, this is Tony Cannon. So, like, I was his alibi. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to molest your kid or anything like that. I just want to give him a stuffed animal. So, <laughs> embarrassing. You know, he bragged about his mailbag, but I was tired of answering the technical questions, getting an email. Hey, kid, can you help me with that? <laughs> so thanks, Paul. I, I want half of his check if you want to do that. The Mexican dinners, I mean, but, you know, I, I, I could go on and on and on. I mean, three things that I think I needed to say here uh, was obviously when I lost my job in 2010, that guy, he was my, he's my manager. He was my manager and never actually charged me a penny. I mean, he would write a story about me. He would come up, what are you doing today? I said, Robin, stop. It's kind of obvious that you kind of like tried to get me a job. And that's not cool. I mean, it's, but he was. And that, that was him. He was a friend. I mean, we, we hung in the house. We, we, I mean, we, we talked. We talked every day. Uh, we cussed a lot. Um, I remember two episodes. One, uh, you know, I've been through you know, in IndyCar for 23 years old. First, you know, uh, management change in IndyCar said, Robin, who is this cowboy that is coming over here with this cowboy boots? And I cannot understand him. After I met AJ, I can clearly understand Randy <laughs> extremely well. And he would go through and he made us meet. And then, uh, you know, I think in early days, is you got to talk to him. He's awesome and this and that. And then years later, I said, Robin, who's this tennis player that is coming here to, like, run this show? Which was Mark that came in from, and, you know, we, we met. So Robin was that kind of guy, trying to connect everybody, trying to make the sport better. And that was, uh, that was him. So I will not finish my remarks until, let's, let's, let's listen, Jim, let's listen to the two losers that we asked to talk about Robin for a little bit. All right, thanks, TK. <laughs> Speaking of TK, it's nice that you're wearing uh, Tony's what is that retirement number one sure this is the first one of his uh i think we're calling it the green white checker <laughs> is this maybe another couple retirements going on i don't know how many how many retirements is in tk's size because <laughs> it's, it's pretty short on the old arms yeah i think somebody shrunk that one maybe i watched Actually, it, it might too. be yours you know trying um, to get to the wallet uh-huh mm -hmm. very good anyway tk how many retirements are you actually going to do but okay let's focus on on our pal robin um my biggest memory of Robin. Um, well, I think, first of all, he was definitely the, he kept us all honest. You know, whether oh, you were, yeah, whether you was, were his friend or what, if you did something he didn't agree with, he, he called you out on it, normally in print. Um, but I loved the, the dinners we got to, to go to. Um, him, Shank, TV's day first, and whoever else showed up. And I mean, that could be AJ Foy, could be Mario Andretti, Dan Gurney, Pernelli Jones, Uncle Bobby, or Johnny Rutherford, but Johnny never, ever, ever picked up the bill for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> ever. Kind of like you, Dix. Come on. <laughs> so, I love that Robin would show up with those photographs. He'd just show up <clears throat> random photos, and he'd put them out, and, and it, was, it got the conversation going, and the conversations you had with these type of people, instigated by Robin, were, were incredible. And as someone that, that, loved, that loves the sport, um, for me, it was, it was like being at Disneyland. And I'll always, always be grateful to Robin for that, as well as the, his contributions to my Jim Clark group. There was all these random, random um, things that he would come up with and give me that you could never, ever replace. For me too, though, you know, those dinners were one, you know, to whether it was going for, for lunch at, at uh, IHOP, one of his favourite places, <laughs> <laughs> right down, actually down the road from, from uh, my house. He loved quality food. He did love quality food, but he was the gateway for me, you know, learning about the history of the speedway obviously you know i was a big fan and, and had heroes you know 
um, like AJ and, and Mario and, and, you know, Mears and, and you know, the, the Mount Rushmore right here, you know, uh, but it was fun to just hear the real truth and the stories, you know, of, of what actually went on, you know, whether it was the little bit of cheating or, <laughs> or, or um, you know, the parties or whatever it was. Or when this guy disagreed with this guy and what actually happened on this day, that was that got pretty dirt, interesting. The, the dirt was the best part. Um, and then obviously to also, you know, uh, pick up the gifts of lingerie that he would uh, buy for my wife, which was uh, always interesting. <laughs> I'm sure, Shunk, you, you had a part in that as well. But, you know, uh, for me, it was just his passion for the sport was incredible. And, in, you know, even, you know, uh, Nashville weekends, you know, he's calling relentlessly after the race to try and, you know, how was the race? How was the fans? You know, he, he just, you know, he, he loved the sport so much and, and tried to better it or help it in any way that he could. But the brutal honesty that he had was also yeah. very important. Yeah, absolutely. And you and him shared that passion for um, Thousand Island dressing. <laughs> Thousand Island fixes every, every uh, I, I can say bad food uh, or bad meal. Thousand Island, that's a, that's a trick. So you go, you've learned something today. Well, anyway, uh, Robin, we're going to miss you. Um, you were such a, a, a great part of our lives in IndyCar racing. Just uh, won't be the same. Over to you guys. Miss you, man. And uh, lots of love to the family. Losers. Anyway, um, I, uh, you know, I just want to finish my remarks. Actually, uh, trying to get not to get too serious, but actually, you know, the funny part. I was talking to Lauren on the way here, and to come up here and talk about Robin and what we've learned from Robin. Everybody would expect that uh, if you would ask me, what have I learned in life, you know, or in racing from Robin. And actually, it's funny because it's nothing about racing. It's actually about life. I think uh, he's the guy that actually wouldn't care what he wore, wouldn't care what car he drove, he wouldn't care what watch he had. He didn't want things, and he just lived to be Robin, an asshole at times, a nice guy at times with the biggest heart. But, you know, and I, I'm going to use that example for probably the rest of my life. I mean, sometimes we get carried on about having things, conquering things, and he just wanted to be here. So from one asshole to the other, I'll see you in hell. I'm Diane Miller Zachary. Uh, I had the privilege of being Robin Miller's little sister. Um, I have a long list of thank yous. Um, I think I'm going to get my thank yous out of the way because I don't want to cry. And uh, I have a lot of people to be very grateful to for helping put on this wonderful celebration of life today. Um, first of all, I'm sorry about the weather. And whoever mentioned it, this is on Robin. Uh, the day he passed, Indianapolis got four inches of rain, more lightning, more thunder, more, you know, lightning strikes. I think, I think it hit a car dealership, and I don't know how many went up in flame. So um, this was typical. I thought, okay, Robin, couldn't it wait till two and we could get out of here? But I guess not. But uh, I'd like to thank Roger Pinsky. Um, Robin considered Roger a very, very, very dear friend. And uh, they had a lot of great conversations and a lot of great times together. And I thank Roger and everyone from IMS to give us this lovely facility today to have this wonderful celebration of life. Um, I'd also like to thank Randy Bernard, who you heard from earlier, who, with his generosity, put on this amazing, amazing stage, drive-in theater screen, um, beautiful backlighting, wonderful film and audio. And uh, he's had also a lot of help with this production has been Steve Shunk, who I do believe deserves an Academy Award, probably an enemy and a Tony. And also Jim Roeder, who's been by his side helping him all week as well. 
Um, I had a lovely escort to the stage today, Dave first. Uh, Robin and Dave were very good friends, and he's the only person that came to mind that could host this event and bring it all together. Um, Paul Flanner, with Racer Magazine, um, not only do I love him dearly for hiring my brother, um, but I, I'd like to thank him for helping us with the swag bags today with the nice racer emblem on with Robin. And while I'm talking about Paul and the bag, late in Robin's life, when he was in the hospital, Steve Shunk and Tim Coffeen and myself were helping Robin with the mailbag. I helped just a teeny bit, but Shunk typed until like 2.30 in the morning once in his hotel, in, hotel, in his hospital room, and Fino was trying to help him with the, you know, the, the, uh, the car questions, you know, the engine questions, things like that, in case Tony wasn't near the phone. So, <laughs> you know, Steve was answering, helping Robin answer questions. They even asked my opinion a couple times, which was kind of funny. But uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful moment for Tim and Steve and I to have the privilege to just help a little bit with uh, the mailbag. Um, okay, I got that page. There we go. Um, I have to say thank you to the state of Indiana and the governor for the Sagamore of the Wabash. I, that's quite an incredible achievement, and I think that's fantastic. Um, and I'd like to thank anybody who contributed a video, a snapshot, uh, a kind word, a cuss word, whatever it took to put it together. Thank you, thank you very much. I hope you uh, rode, were able to read his obituary that is inside the Razor magazine, inside the swag bag. Um, T.E. McHale, I asked him to write his obituary, but nothing like you would see in a newspaper. And I hope you all take a moment to read it. It's got a nice bookmark that says, Ball State Cardinal Proud. Uh, the night before we lost Robin, the president of Ball State University wrote a letter to him. Unfortunately, Robin never got to read it. But it made reference to the Racer article when Robin talked and thanked all the Racer Nation for being there all those years for him. So I hope you read that as well. Um, if you got your swag bag, I hope you're enjoying them. Uh, Linda Rosenberg, she had some really cool towels made. Um, I know the Steelers have theirs, but now we have Robin Miller. So, you know, we can swing our little spirit, spirit towels. Tony's got one out. Can you show it for us? There you go. Yeah, show your spirit. Uh, maybe it'll be in your golf bag. Maybe you'll clean poop up, poop off your shoe. I don't know. <laughs> maybe it'll be by your bar be, to remind you not to drink too much because Robin never had a drink. And while I'm mentioning that, Robin's here with us today. If you'll look over on uh, the little table by the beautiful, beautiful Jim Herbie's Novi, you'll see Parnelli Jones number 40 turban. Well, that is actual, an actual uh, vintage liquor decanter, which is kind of ironic, but that's what I chose to put Robin in because I looked and looked for something to put Robin in and there was nothing appropriate. You know, I, I, I just couldn't find anything. And so I found that online and it was really beat up and I called Shunk and I said, Shunk, sir, what about this to put Robin in? I said, you know, it's racing, it's the 500, it's the turban, I mean, come on. And he goes, I've got one in my living room, it's perfect, I'll give it to you. So my, uh, I, took, I took the empty container over to Conkle in Speedway where everybody goes and they had never received anything like that. And they said, you want us to what? And I said, I'd like you, I don't think he'll all fit in there, but what you can, could you, I'd like him in this. So, and if it had been an oval track set up today, we were thinking about asking Mario to take him in the two-seater on one final lap. 
So, but we couldn't get that worked out. But we had a great time, and when uh, it was time for me to pick him up, they sent me a text and they said, Diane Robbins to, ready to be picked up. We topped him off, and he's ready for his final lap. Aww. And I thought that was really, really sweet. Um, I also want to thank um, Jamie Harding Furlow. Uh, she also had um, helped us get the bags and oh, oh yeah. and the lanyards, your very official credentials. Um, the Speedway wanted to make sure we had some kind of signage to know that we were actually supposed to be on the grounds today. And I had more fun making these, so I hope you enjoy these. They won't get you anywhere except in this room, <laughs> but at least you're here, and that's fun. So um, I think the last thing I have to say as far as thank yous is uh, I want to thank my family. Um, I came in May to see Robin and to come to the 500, and I never went home. And uh, so they had a, what I think a four-month vacation for me, but they were nice enough to uh, loan me out to Robin, and uh, he really appreciated that. And um, I wouldn't have uh, spent any, it's, it was the most uh, humbling and most rewarding time to spend with Robin those last four months. And uh, we laid in the same bed one night and took a nap. I watched a lot of golf. I learned a lot more about golf. Uh, we watched a lot of football. We watched every race, didn't matter what, who was racing, what was racing, we watched. And, uh, you know, he gave me a lot of insight on over the years. We, we uh, really reflected on his career, on all the drivers, and all the mechanics. Everybody, everybody actually touched his life. And if you're in this room and you knew Robin, you touched his life, and he loved you all dearly. So I can't thank you enough for being here, and my family, and all my friends. And I have to say a special shout out to my personal friends that have been my rock for the last four months. Uh, my best friend or her husband. If Robin was in the hospital, they lived a half a mile, so I stayed there. If Robin was out of the hospital, I lived with Robin at his condo. And nobody ever spent the night at Robin's condo. Wow. You know, well, wow. well, that, like, yeah, yeah, I, okay, we won't go yeah. there, okay. <laughs> yeah. Invite, like, a family member like myself, let's yeah. put it that way. We're good. So anyway, um, but they did everything for me. I mean, um, you know, they'd help me get Robin to the hospital. They'd help me get Robin out of the hospital. They would run a million errands. Um, they drove like a bat out of hell and got us to the hospital. Um, they helped us one night when he collapsed. I mean, one of my dear friends and a neighbor helped me carry him to the car. And my neighbors are here too, and I love them all, or his neighbors are here, and I love them as well. Um, it just takes a village and you're all a part of this village. And Robin's personal friends, they were my rock as well. Steve and Larry and Larry and Joe, and just on and on and on. It's just wonderful to have you all because I couldn't have done it without all of you. So thank you so very much. Um, I think, and also the doctors and the nurses, they're just not doctors and nurses. They're angels, and they're angels among us. And they became family. Uh, whether Robin spent a lot of time in the BMT clinic, and sometimes he was there three times a week getting blood and platelets and infusions. And we uh, bought a lot of donuts from Long's and a lot of Freddy cheeseburgers and milkshakes. And, you know, Robin always wanted to take care of everybody, and so they were there to take care of him. But he was buying donuts and lunches and dinners all the time. And um, I'll actually miss going there because they truly were family to us. So um, just a couple more things. This is my eldest daughter, Emily Rose. And we always called her Emily Rose. And Robin always called her Emily Rose. And this is our youngest, Ashley. Ashley Suzanne, but we just called her Ashley. <laughs> or the Tasmanian Devil. So. I, I used to say if she'd been first, she would have been last and only. But Emily came first. So Emily was more like the textbook Dr. Spock. You know, she just, she was the first grandchild. 
and she was our first child, and so she was just doted over so much, and my mother would teach her poetry, and my mother would say, Emily, recite Little Orphan Annie, and Emily would say, which stanza? And then Ashley was born, and her hands on her hip like, I'm not talking about Little Orphan Annie. I mean, you know, we had, we had great times with Uncle Robin. He used to bring them out in the track, put them in the golf cart, drive all around the grounds. One time he let Emily drive. How old were you? Oh, Get your too, microphone. Um, way too young to be driving. I don't know how old I was. I should have never been behind the wheel. And what did you run into? Oh. I remember if you don't. No, tell it. Okay. In the old <laughs> days, the old garage was the very near and dear to my heart and where the old media room was. He said, honey, just roll it right up here and stop. She did, right into the wall. And we came to a stop. So... Get your microphone. I think you did too. I also hit someone with you a hit golf a car. Cart. I ran into a, a, car. a park car. A park car. Sorry. And I think his words were, "Oh, I don't want to say it because my grandkids are down." But you know, <laughs> what the hell were you looking at? I'm like, I don't know. They're nine and ten. What do you want them to look at? I don't know. So um, anyway, um, I also wanted to say something with both my daughters here. When Robin and I, um, he, he hooked us up with Tom Sneva. My husband, Tom, was the big driver education guru in the state of Indiana and passed a lot of legislation and things like that. A lot of former drivers out here, you know, he helped, unlike Robin. And um, he said, hey, I know somebody who would invest in your business, and he'd like it a lot. And we were like, well, who? And he goes, well, Tom Sneva. And of course, we were shocked. And so we got hooked up with Tom Sneva and became good friends. But we had Tom Sneva School of Safe Driving. And it was a wonderful, wonderful relationship. Well, we went out with Robin to Vegas. Raise your hand if you've ever been to Robin in Vegas. So, OK, enough said. And then we went to Vegas for, I think, 26 hours, stayed up all, all night long, all day. And then we drove to Phoenix to see Tom Sneva drive. Well, before we left town, Ashley was six months old, Ash Emily was seven, and we didn't have a will, so we made a will. And, um, you know, my, my parents were getting older and not in the best health, so we put a limit on what age they could care for my daughters, our daughters, and then we made Uncle Robin the next of kin. If anything happened to my parents, or by a certain age, if they were still living, he was in charge. That would have been fun. Yeah. That would have been so, a totally different um, experience. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? They would have had the coolest childhood. Can you imagine? Come on, kids. We're going to go eat French fries and cheeseburgers, and uh, I'll teach you how to gamble. You know, <laughs> we'll play craps outside. I don't know what he would have said, but it would have been fun. I do know they would have been well taken care of. They would have still been able to continue their dance education and maybe stay in school. So <laughs> we would have probably written that somewhere. But um, I don't know. I wanted both of them to say a little something. What was one of your fondest memories? Uh, well, hi. <laughs> I just want to say that a lot of people have talked about the state fair and those giant um, stuffed animals that you guys all won playing those basketball games, the probably thousands of dollars that he spent playing those games. Uh, I'm a proud owner of one of those giant stuffed animals. Lauren knows what I'm talking about. It was like a five old goes west, like, five foot tall mouse that we had down in our basement. I really loved that thing, so that was great. Um, another thing, uh, Uncle Robin, <laughs> this is just funny, you'll get a kick out of this. I think when I was about six years old, my uncle looked at my mom and said, she's either gonna be in jail or a stripper by the time she's 16. <laughs> and I'm proud to say that I uh, achieved neither of those things <laughs> yet. Uh, my daughter Harlow, we'll see how she does. She's two, so she's got a, a ways to go. But. <laughs> um, I think, well, as we all know, Uncle Robin was always at many, many events. Um, but we made sure we gave him a little extra culture coming to dance events. He probably sat through 11 or 12 years of the Nutcracker. Um, not his first choice to come to a ballet, but he was there every year, dead center, you know, about five rows back. But it was the first year I was in the show, um, 
he leaned over to my mom about 10 minutes into the production and he said, they're not talking. <laughs> or singing. Or singing. When are they gonna start? And she said, Robin, it's a ballet. They don't speak, they don't sing. And he was like, oh. Kind of sat back like, you know, we're only 10 minutes in, that's a two hour production. Um, then it got yeah, a little he closer. He said they were clock, he goes, I'm clocking them. I'm clocking Exact them. words. Like he's clocking I'm clocking them. Yeah. 10 minutes. Then it gets closer and he said, when's halftime? <laughs> Well, at the theater, it's called intermission. So, you know, we had, we had great stories like that. I mean, and it just go, went on and on and on. And it, you know, we got him in formal attire at my wedding, which was amazing, yeah. He was dressed very nice, very chic, uh, very GQ. But all of my professors, all of my dance teachers, everybody that saw him at the Nutcracker, he was in his Robin Miller attire at Clues Hall, at the Mira. Um, he saw many performances of Ashley and I doing the Radio City Christmas Spectacular. He would spend our holidays in whatever city we were on the road performing in, and luckily he didn't mind traveling and was used to it. But um, it, it was fun. We always kept him going. He was there to cheer us on, and I will tell you, we had the best Christmases. Nobody else could even imagine what our Christmas days were. Um, I wish everybody could experience it. It was like no other. The stories that were told, um, it, it was just one for the books. Year after year, um, I've battled with my own family on what they needed to wear attire-wise. And they said, well, Uncle Robin's gonna be there. Can't I just wear this? And I was like, he, he gets a pass. You don't, you have to dress this way. And he's like, I don't have to be in a collared shirt. He's gonna be in a Colts hoodie or a, or a, a, a racer, or blah, 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 whatever. And so, you know, the. It was always funny moments, it was always great times, and it really, it made everything that much more fun. Um, speaking of Christmas, sometimes 45 minutes before the family would gather, Robin would call and say, um, hey, Diane, you mind if I bring somebody to Christmas? And I'm like, um, no, uh, uh, of course, who is it? Oh, it's this sweet gal, she's stranded in Indianapolis tonight, She's, she's supposed to be, she's supposed to be on the East Coast, but her plane's not flying out for another day. Is there any way I could bring her? And I said, yeah, can you tell me a little bit about her? And he goes, oh yeah, she's one of my favorite blackjack dealers out in Atlantic City. And we always try to get together when she's in town and she has nowhere to go today. And I said, Okay, great. So, you know, we'd scramble to find a gift, make a place at the table, things like that. You know, he never wanted anybody not to have a great Christmas, to be left alone. He always had, he had the biggest heart of anybody I ever knew. He did anything and everything. These girls never went without anything. If I ever needed a little help, you know, he was always there. Pay me back when you can, kid, no worries. He was just, he was just the nicest guy. He was a character, and as you say, he was a little bit of an ass, or a lot of an ass, either way you look at it. <clears throat> but he was one of a kind, and I don't think we would have wanted him to be any different than the way he truly, truly was. <clears throat> um, I was trying to think of one other thing um, funny about Robin, but there's so many. I know one thing, um, in the month of May, I'd come out and I'd, I was fortunate enough to have credentials, which I was a huge race fan. When we were little, my mom and dad were depression kids. They didn't go to college, but they worked very, very hard. And we had a wonderful, you know, lovely Leave it to Beaver-like life. And Robin was a little bit more like Eddie Haskell than Beaver. And uh, when we couldn't afford tickets, we would stand on the far side of uh, on the back stretch beyond the, the links, the golf course, and stand at the, the fence and watch maybe the first 25 laps because we couldn't afford tickets and then we'd go home and listen to it on the radio. And I, my first recollection of coming to the Speedway, my mother and I had matching checkered dresses. We sat in Tower Terrace. It was a Sunday afternoon. I had a snow cone and Robin was hands on the wire fence, watching every moment, every moment. He wouldn't stay in his, his seat. But uh, our love of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway started very early in life, and he 
this is home to him, and I'm so glad we could be here today to do this. But uh, one more thing I wanted to say, when I, in May, when I was out here, and I'd get people would say, are you Robin Miller's sister? And they'd say it kind of like, not mean, but almost mean. And I'd say, why? I never said yes or no during the month of May at the track. They'd say, are you Robin Miller's sister? No, I would say, why? And if it was friendly, then I'd admit it. If they'd say something nasty and hateful, I said, yeah, he's kind of a jerk, you know? <laughs> I just went with the flow because you never knew. I mean, I didn't want to, you know, have a beer spilled on my head. I didn't know what was coming, so. But uh, it was really great to be Robin's little sister. We were really good friends growing up. He was a great big brother. Uh, through the elementary, middle school years, I was annoying. High school was better. In college, he wanted to meet all my friends. So, but... Uh, I just can't thank you enough for being here. <clears throat> I have to tell you that Steve Shunk has been adopted as my new big brother, whether he wants to be or not. We spend like a lot of time together and uh, putting this together, it's been very, very special. So just thank you so much for coming and uh, I hope you had a wonderful time. I can't thank you enough. I think it's time for Shunkster to come up and uh, say a few words. Yeah, uh, as mentioned, thank you, Diane uh, and Ashley and Emily. Uh, it's been a tremendous afternoon, obviously. Thank you so much for your attendance uh, and your patience and, and being with us because uh, we couldn't do this without all of uh, his friends and, and family members. Our special thanks to the, everybody at the IMS Museum for one of the best set pieces I think you could ever come across for a situation like this. So thank you very much. And just so everybody knows, we've, we've left an open seat in the media center for the last three uh, NTT IndyCar Series races. I think we'll probably have something uh, moving, moving forward uh, for Robin as well. All right, so before we wrap it up, one final speaker. Please welcome the aforementioned many times Steve Shunk. Go ahead. First of all, big round of applause, Dave first. Wonderful job by Davey. I am going to keep this so short and sweet because Rob will be going, God damn it, we got to get the working man's friend. They're going to be closed. We got to get there for lunch. So, first of all, again, thanks to Dave, thanks to Jim Roeder. Museum staff did a great job on this. Robin hasn't been ornery, said anything wrong. He's in his little turban. He's all good. A couple things I was going to talk about, but I'm going to make this less than 30. And his doctors and nurses. I grew to love them too. You guys did a wonderful job. We we're going to talk about It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World as his favorite movie. Not time for that. We we're going to talk about Saturday Night Live, about Massive Head Wound Harry and Ed Grimley. Not time for those stories. We we're going to talk about how this man could find downtown parking in Indianapolis when every parking spot would fall. Well, Shunkster, I'm right around the corner. I'm, I'm not paying anything. They're trying to screw you out of money in this place. I like to thank the Canadians for coming. I appreciate them coming across the border. Thank you very much. Uh, Robin loved happy smiling faces. We'll talk about all that later on too. I'm going to go off with this. There's the Dr. Seuss saying, and I used it about my friend Bobby Unser, and I think it applies to the beloved Jenks who we also lost. Don't cry because it's over, but smile because it happened. If this clip right here doesn't make you smile and remember Robin Miller as we all want to remember him, nothing will. Thank you everybody for coming. Drive safe, spade or neuter your pets. Here you go. Okay, so let's bring in Robin Miller now from Cleveland and Paul Tracy. This is a guy that Sebastian Bourdais actually called washed up. <laughs> well, I think when you're close to 40, you haven't won a race in a couple years, Nicole. If anybody needed a victory. Get the fuck off the racetrack! You stupid son of a bitch! I think we have to start again. <laughs> Sorry about that, Greggy. That was really classic. We're only on the bird, it's okay. Sorry. Thank you, everyone.
as people are on the way out, like we always said, in lieu of flowers, there's a QR code or something on the back table. You don't have to do it today, but if you'd like, you can QR code, pick a charity to give some money to, keep Robin's spirit alive with everybody. Thank you again. Thanks.